lifting up the book of Ephesians and talking about the armor of God. We got, got, got a lot of good feedback from that. And I was uh, teaching in the school, Steve and Brady and myself went to the school on Tuesday morning and uh, had a, a, a miniature uh, piece of armor there, uh, suit of armor I should say, and uh, taught the kids about that and Steve played his guitar and we had a, a wonderful time at the school on Tuesday morning. They'll be in spring break this week and then I'll go back for another couple of weeks uh, teaching about the armor of God in the school. And so uh, it's been a, a great week, a, a, quite a trying week being shut in with all the rains and praying about the different needs of people and uh, rescues and wrecks and things like that. We had quite a few calls this last week, a lot of activity going on. Much to pray about, much to do, and, uh, and at the same time, uh, much to uh, thank God for. Amen. And that's what Abby was doing when I was talking to her on the phone. Uh, and she was just uh, thanking God that her family was safe and that uh, the Lord was good to her. Amen. And uh, that's exactly what a child of God does. Amen. And so Luke 23 tonight, uh, to, uh, th this morning rather, it's far from nighttime, <laughs> it's early. Uh, and, uh, you, you pray for me, I'm in a different world. But uh, Luke 23, starting at verse 33 and 34, the seven sayings from the cross. And let me ease your mind, we're not going to get through all seven, okay? <laughs> And we'll probably just get through the first one, but but uh, because it's so important as to what each thing that Christ said from the cross. But we wanted to talk about the cross today because we're looking forward to that uh, time of Easter as we talk about the resurrection. But the cross of Calvary was a time when God uh, did business with sin, dealt completely and thoroughly with your sin, my sin, and the sin of the whole world. And so because of that, uh, we look to the cross and we see uh, the sufferings and the saints uh, that Christ did. The, the things that he said, not only what he did on the cross, but the things that he said are very, very significant. There are seven different sayings on the cross. And this is one of them. It says that when they had come to the place called Calvary, they, uh, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said these words. He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Father, forgive them. Let us pray. Dear Father, we're grateful for your forgiveness that uh, was spoken on the cross. And Lord, the, the, the work of redemption then backed it up and Lord substantiated that and made it, made it a completed transaction, and we're thankful for that. And so, Lord, we're thankful that our Lord and Savior uh, was thinking about us and not himself when he hung up there on the cross of Calvary, and we're grateful for that this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So each one of these seven sayings are filled with meaning and purpose. They're definitely not the words of someone who... Uh, we could say that was someone that didn't really think about anything but himself. He, he was thinking about others all along. We have a terrific teaching in the four Gospels. We have his final sayings as well. And uh, these sayings are riveting. They're piercing. They're beautiful, and yet they're shocking. Because as we, we see these kinds of words that uh, uh, came from our Savior's lips, uh, the, we find that the sacrificial blood was splashing on the ground. His body was racked with pain. His throat was parched with thirst. He had no energy uh, to waste on trivial matters. And so the words that he spoke were words uh, that came from his heart and that he felt was necessary, very necessary, uh, so that they might be recorded in the Word of God for us uh, to know, uh, to understand, and to appreciate. Uh, we're going to dwell on each one of these things, but first of all, we want to talk about uh, the, the, the whole of what was said. 
The first saying uh, was to uh, take place between 9 a.m. in the morning and noon. And when he said, Father, forgive them, and that's what we'll cover this morning. And then, uh, then he, when he spoke with uh, the uh, one uh, criminal uh, that uh, said, uh, I'm uh, asking that uh, you uh, would forgive me, and he said, you, today you'll be with me in paradise. And that is in Luke chapter 23, verse 43. And then when he uh, talked uh, to John uh, concerning his mother, he was concerned about the care of his mother, and he turned the care of his mother over uh, to John the Apostle. And he said in John 19 and verse 26, Woman, behold your son. And so in essence, he was turning uh, his uh, place over to uh, John to say, John, you take care of my mother. Uh, she's now your mother. You take care of her. And then we find from noon to 3 o'clock, there was darkness over the land. And then at the very last of that time period, uh, here's what the Lord cried out and said. In Matthew 27, verse 46, he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you have to understand the context of what was going on. He wasn't talking about the suffering, the physical suffering. He was talking about the fact uh, that uh, God had turned his back upon his own son because he had taken uh, the sins of the whole world upon him in his body and paid the price and God could not look upon the sin. And so uh, he said, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God had to turn his back uh, on his own son uh, hanging on the cross because he was paying the price. And then he said uh, in John 19, verse 28, I thirst. I thirst. And he was very thirsty on the cross. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments. And the fact that uh, they gave him uh, some hyssop and, and put it on a sponge and lifted it up to his lips. But notice it also, we find that uh, uh, he said the words in John 19 and verse 30, it is finished. And that's a, a great statement. Because it, it shows the finality of it all. It shows it was a completed transaction. And it's a, a, a great uh, statement, a doctrinal statement as well. The fact that the work of redemption was finished. And then uh, the very last thing that he said, uh, to, and he prayed to the Father, he says, Into thy hands I commit my spirit. And, and that's what he did in Luke 23 and verse 46. So these words teach the rich doctrines of Christianity. They teach of forgiveness, of faith, of family, the humanity of Christ, as well as his substitutionary death. They teach about uh, the person of Christ and the purpose of Christ as he came here upon this earth. The, let's uh, uh, set the scene, first of all, recounting the events. First of all, we see there's an article uh, that was written by a physician that tried to take these events of the, of the crucifixion and the trial and the beating of the Lord Jesus Christ and tried to describe in medical terms uh, what this meant uh, to our Savior. And I'm just going to briefly uh, run through some of the highlights of what he said. The la very last 12 to 18 hours of the Lord Jesus' life. We find him, first of all, in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 44. And it says, In being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And so the loss of blood and the sweat uh, would create the beginning stages of dehydration. An angel appeared at that point and, and began to minister uh, to the Lord and gave him some strength. In verse 43 of Luke 22, we read about that. Then Jesus then was arrested and faced the trial sometime after midnight. And he was led away with his hands bound, the same hands that had healed the sick, and had raised the dead, and that had ministered uh, to uh, many people. Those same hands were bound and uh, uh, as part of the trial, uh, the mock trial that he went through. Then we find that uh, he was uh, scourged. And we find that at this time, he was exhausted from a lack of sleep. He faced a second trial. And both of these uh, trials were illegal. 
according to a Roman law, according to Jewish law. And so uh, Jesus was now exhausted, uh, exhausted by lack of sleep, abuse, and loss of fluids, and ridicule. And then in an attempt to appease the people, Pilate had him scourged. And he thought, well, this would dis uh, that would appease the people. It would be over with. And this was not something that was ordinarily done as a part of a crucifixion. But the scourging was a, a cat of nine tails. It, it was a, a leather a, 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 a throng, a leather whip, uh, and on the end of each piece was a, a pieces of bone, pieces of metal. That was tied to that, that would uh, 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 dig into the back of our Lord and Savior and wrap around his flesh and tear the flesh away. And I know it's a gross thing to think about, but notice these whips, uh, they, they were uh, whips that would uh, uh, take, and many people died just from the beatings uh, that they would uh, uh, endure uh, in a time like that. Then a crown of six inch long thorns was uh, pressed deeply into his scalp. And this would have caused additional blood loss as it uh, came across his shoulders and back. The, uh, the purple robe then was placed across him. And it uh, served as a temporary compressive dressing to help congeal the blood pouring out from his gaping lesions. But the mockery continues as the soldiers, as they spit on him, they beat on him with reeds, and they held him as the king of the Jews. Pilate then presents Jesus to the crowd, wearing his thorns in his robe, and he says, Behold the man. And he had written uh, up there uh, Jesus being uh, the king of the Jews and got ridiculed for that, but he says, What I have written, I have written. We find that then they took the, the purple robe, the scarlet robe, and stripped it away. And this then exposed his wounds once again. Pilate now uh, to, succumbs to the manipulation of Jewish leaders. And Jesus is condemned to death by crucifixion. Notice then Jesus is given the cross beam to bear to the place of the skull, Golgotha, the cross, to bear his own cross. And he was weakened at this time. They say that uh, this could have been as much as 100 pounds of weight. And he had to drag along, and so they they uh, in, uh, uh, enlisted a band to come, Simon to come, and to uh, help carry the cross during this time. Notice then we uh, in the uh, we find that uh, Luke twenty three verse thirty three gives a very brief statement about the crucifixion. In fact, in the Greek, only three words are used to describe this. But we find that uh, we know more about the specifics from how the Romans recorded the gory details. And it says in, in Luke 23, verse 33, And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him, the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And so the reason why they put Jesus in the middle, because that was the most prominent uh, place uh, to say, this is the one that we're really after. This is the one. This is our target. This is really what we're here about. And so, no doubt he experienced severe muscular pain in his upper extremities. It only got worse as the joints separated as he hung on the cross. According to Roman historians, it's very common for people uh, that are crucified to keep, be in a delusional state. To be talking out of their head, out of their mind. To be saying uh, things and cursings and, and things to their, even to their families and, and uh, to their nation and everything else just to, uh, to not have any control whatsoever. And we find in each one of these seven sayings, our Lord uh, had a great uh, uh, perception. He had great control of his speech and what he said. We find was a, in fact, we find that Peter was amazed, and he wrote it down, uh, recorded in a verse, uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23. It says, who when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, 
But he committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. Jesus then could have rightly prayed, uh, Father, uh, consume them and wipe them out. But instead he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so we find that this begins in a prayer as he's praying to the Father. But something else that I uh, uh, would fail uh, to, if I mention just the physical suffering on the cross, as bad as the physical suffering is, I want you to consider with me uh, this morning the, uh, the actual saying that he said, the forgiveness. And this pictures the, the spiritual suffering, the eternal suffering uh, that our Lord did on the cross. When I was growing up as, as a child, in a, in a church, I, every time in this time of year, just before Easter, the preacher would get up and preach a, a, a lesson, a, prayer, a, 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 a sermon about the crucifixion of Jesus and how awful it was physically. But I, I, he really failed in many times to emphasize the a spiritual side of this uh, equation, to understand uh, that our Lord and Savior uh, was the perfect, uh, sinless Son of God. And for Him to take on the sins of the whole world was a horrific thing, not just the physical side of the suffering of it, but think about uh, the, the, the suffering, the spiritual suffering. Of the, and, and I had it described to me this way. Picture in your mind the most godly person that you could imagine. I, I picture in my mind a, a dear, dear, sweet lady uh, that I uh, uh, knew for many years. She's passed on now. Miss uh, Hortense Caldwell. She was a great, great lady, sweet lady, and godly lady. Always a picture of modesty and, and godliness and, and uh, sweetness. Grace uh, just seemed to uh, come from her lips every time she spoke. And uh, uh, she was a, a godly woman. And uh, uh, just think about the most godly person you could think of. And then think about the most uh, reviled, uh, most uh, 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 horrific sinner uh, coming in and uh, violating her and, and uh, cursing at her and, and doing things like that to her. <coughs> and just think about that. And I, I, that, that's the kind of understanding that we have just a, a measure of understanding of what our Lord was faced with when he was spit upon and reviled by uh, these who had crucified him. And then consider the fact uh, that uh, uh, we there are also participating. He you say, preacher, I didn't, I didn't crucify the Lord. Yes, we did. Our sin. Your sin, my sin. Uh, crucified the Lord. And so we have to understand that. We have to own that. So first of all, we find that when Jesus spoke these words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It was a prayer. And Jesus prayed. And he had prayed for us in the garden. He had prayed for the church. He had prayed for us that would, would, that would follow. Meaning the fact that he was praying for you and I. And I, I love that song that was written, and I don't know who wrote it, but it says that when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. And I truly, truly believe that because a God knows all. He knows the future. He knows people in the future. And he was praying for us in uh, John 17 in his high priestly prayer there at the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was praying for us. And so as he prays for these to, to be forgiven. Now the word forgive is a very interesting word. And it's hard for us to comprehend and to understand and to experience forgiveness and to, and to uh, uh, give forgiveness to others. It's, it's not an easy task. And uh, we think about forgiveness in many ways. And many levels of forgiveness. 
But I want you to understand what the Lord Jesus was trying to say here, or what, what he was saying, and what we're trying to understand about his forgiveness. They say that the tense, that this <laughs> word forgive, is a given. It carries with it the weight of meaning of an echo. And not just an echo that kind of fades away but an echo that continues on throughout all of eternity. When he said forgive, then it continues on. Forgive, 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 forgive. And throughout all of eternity, uh, to you, and it reaches to you and I. It reaches down into our souls to understand that that forgiveness that he spoke on the cross, was forgiveness for you and I that he spoke. And so he was doing the deed. Then he was saying the words. And in all of this, it, it formed a transaction of for great forgiveness, of eternal forgiveness. And notice the public ministry of Jesus began with prayer. In Luke chapter 3, verse 21, it says, And while he prayed, the heavens opened. He flooded heaven with his prayers during his three years of ministry here on this earth. And he urged his followers to do the same. His time on earth ended with prayer as he continuously repeated this prayer of forgiveness. And then listen to Hebrews chapter uh, uh, 7 and verse 25. It says that he always lives, and he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Because he's always praying for us. And so as he prayed on the cross, he continues to pray even now. Prayer permeated everything he did, and it still does. Let's look a little bit more closely at the first saying, when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This cry from the cross reveals at least five, five significant truths. And first of all, the truth of the fulfillment of prophecy. In Isaiah 53, over 700 years before the Lord went to the cross, you have a description, and here again is the, is the not just the physical uh, description of the of suffering of the Savior, but the spiritual uh, outlines of all this as well. It says in, in verse 3 of Isaiah 53, he would be despised and rejected by men. In verse 3 also it says he would be a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. In verse 4 and verse 8, he would be afflicted by God because of our sins. In verse 5, he would be pierced for our transgressions. In verse 7, he would be wounded and bruised by men. In verse 7, he would be led like a lamb to slaughter and be silent before his accusers. In verse 9, he would be buried in a rich man's tomb. You see the fulfillment of prophecy? Joseph of Arimathea came and, uh, to get the body, and Nicodemus, by the way. The same that came to Jesus by night. The same Nicodemus. And we were uh, so concerned and worried about saying, I wonder if Nicodemus ever got saved. I believe that when Nicodemus came with Joseph of Arimathea, he identified with the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe from that we'll see Nicodemus in heaven. I believe that he never got away from those words when Jesus said he must be born again. I believe we'll see Nicodemus in heaven. But notice then, uh, he, would, he would be the, the sin offering, the guilt offering. He would be numbered with the transgressors in verse 12. He would pray for those transgressors as well. And so the fulfillment of prophecy. Then we find that uh, in, the, in the sayings of the cross, that we see the blindness of the human heart. Jesus <coughs> recognized that those who had crucified him really didn't know what they were doing. You say, well, they knew they were killing him. And they should have known that he was the Son of God because of all the, the, the works that he did and the things that he said and the, the goodness of, of God, the fact that he was indeed the Son of God. 
And some did recognize that. Remember the soldier? Uh, as, he, as he came, uh, the Roman soldier said, Surely he must have been the Son of God. Remember the thief that hung on the one side? And he says, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said, You'll, you'll be with me today in paradise. And so, uh, but it shows the blindness of the human heart. Then it shows also the magnitude of our need. The magnitude of our need, because our hearts are blind and hard, our need is great. The greatest need that we have. A lot of people think, oh, oh, if I could just win the lottery. My goodness. That's, that's, uh, that's not the need that we have. The need that we have is for forgiveness. And then when we have that, uh, then uh, God gives you a, a satisfaction about everything else. Then you don't have to worry about winning the lottery. Amen? Uh, because you have your sins forgiven. And you have everything that you need. You know, like when I talked to Abby on the phone yesterday morning. She said, Brother Cliff, she says, I have everything that I need. <laughs> this is coming from a, a dear lady that lost everything that she ever had and worked for all of her life. And she's told me, she says, I have everything I need. When you have the forgiveness of God, you have everything. Then the identification of Jesus. His death is full payment for the penalty of sin. He pleads with the Father to accept the sacrifice of His blood. And notice how that in all of this, you know, a lot of people look and see the tragedy. But when you look at the cross, see the triumph. Amen. 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 Don't just see the tragedy. In fact, as we talked about in Sunday school this morning, Every tragedy that we're faced with, there is a, a, the grace of God that surfaces. The love of God and the love of God's people, the response of God's people, are like we're going to do here in just a few moments. And so uh, the, uh, the, there, it identifies the Lord Jesus Christ in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin. That we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And so uh, out of this great tragedy came triumph. Out of this sinfulness that was put upon our Savior came the righteousness of God in Him that was put upon us. And so only God can do that. And that leads us to the last point and that is the triumph of the divine love. Jesus requested forgiveness for the unforgivable. And with this prayer, we find that he, he, he was put on, the, as on display on the cross. When man had done his worst, God came through with his best. Amen. As he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they did. And so we find that in Acts chapter 7, Stephen modeled this same thing. When uh, on the, the, uh, he, he cried out, he, he knelt down in Acts 7, verse 60, and cried out with a loud voice as they were stoning him to death. He said, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And then we find that the, the apostle Paul was there. He was Saul of Tarsus that was seeking uh, the uh, papers to uh, uh, condemn more and more Christians to have, us, have them killed. And and here he was there consenting to Stephen's death. And out of, out of that tragedy came trial. Came uh, the Paul. Paul was saved as a result of that. We find that uh, on the day of Pentecost, and thousands of people were saved. And so this thing of forgiveness, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It truly wasn't just words. The forgiveness took, took, and he, uh, uh, he was able to forgive and continues to forgive even now to this day. If you've never experienced the full forgiveness of God, now is the time. Today is the accepted day of salvation. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ.